falcons, uh, redbirds, bulls. Texas. We needed one more player for our office fantasy football league, so we asked Bree. She got a little overinvested. She even hired a fantasy football coach. All right, you gotta stay away from the Cowboys whatsoever. You don't want anybody. Yes, coach. Alabama is not in the NFL. Yes, coach. And King Henry is the GOAT, first rounder. I, no. I thought Tom Brady was the GOAT. I was gonna pick him first. No, Bree. Tom Brady's not even on the Patriots anymore. I don't get it. How how did she do that? She keeps doing it to everybody every week, but this week I, she beat me. She's got Lamar Jackson, uh, Jonathan Taylor, and Debo Samuel all in her lineup. Something is going on here. You lost because you went up against Bree. She's destroying all of us. I don't know. We got to find out who's in charge of this thing. Cougars, Ravens, the Vols, Notre Dame. There you are, Bree. I was hoping you can help me with some pumpkins and picking real quick. John, not right now. Waiver wire comes out in two minutes and I've got Josh Allen on the line. Bree, I am so behind, please. I, I don't have time, I don't have time. Got him. Who is approving these trades? We have come we have come to the end of our series I'm in. Thank you for indulging us for the last few weeks with our silly office videos. Um, they, they've been a lot of fun, sometimes stressful because we just don't know if you're going to laugh or not. Um, so it really warms our hearts when you do. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's been great. I, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed them, but really this is what I hope has happened over this series. I hope that you were challenged by the Holy Spirit to see yourself the way that God sees you. That's been the whole point of these last few weeks together is that we are supposed to be beginning to see what God sees when he looks at his sons and daughters. When he looks at us, he sees that we are invited, right? We talked about the fact that we have been invited into the family of God. You have a seat at the table, the family of God. That's huge. That's massive. That's what it means to, to be in, that you are invaluable. We talked all about this idea of, of the way that God has given us these, these gifts and these, um, you know, these passions and, and these ways that we serve the church, the way that we give back to the church with this idea of the kingdom needs you. So often we feel like we're not a part or we're not needed or, or that no one would even know if we were not there. And that's just not true. The kingdom needs you. This church needs you. Your gifts are needed for this very time. And that's why you have been placed here at this time for that purpose. We also talked about this idea of being influential this, this understanding that, like we've said this morning, you have the power of influence over others. The way that you live into, the way that you speak into, the way that you, you share, you literally have the opportunity to make an introduction to Jesus Christ that will change their life forever. You have that power. That power is not just reserved for the... That power is through his people. And so we've been called to be influential, to share with other people. Not only can it change their lives, but we watch story after story of how it changed their lives and then many other lives after that. The life that you change, it doesn't end there, but God continues to work with your influence. And today we're going to finish this series by talking about what it looks like to be invested. How are we invested in the kingdom of God? God wants us to be invested in his kingdom. He wants us to be invested in his church. And the truth is, we are all already invested in something, right? Like if you believe in something, if you're passionate about something, then, then you are invested in whatever that is. Some of you will buy tickets to your favorite sports team and you will become invested in your favorite sports team, whatever that may be, right? Like you will go and you'll sit in a hundred degree heat because you're invested. You will sit in the rain at Geodis Park because you are invested. You will you will wear the the jersey of your favorite team and let everybody know that, that this is who you are, this is who you belong to, you're supporting that team. You will cheer on your team even when things aren't good for the Titans and you start 0-2. You'll cheer like crazy when they get their first win. That was me last Sunday, right? Like you are invested in something. But here's what we know about being invested. 
Your heart always follows your investment. Your heart moves with your investment. So like if somebody signs you up for a class and they pay for the class, maybe you go ahead and skip class because you're not all that invested. Somebody else is paying for the class. But if you pay for the class, you're going to make sure that you go to class, that you're a part of it, that that you are there. If something comes up, if there's conflict, you're going to make a way to go and and be a part of that. Or if you go on a, a trip or a vacation or something, if somebody pays for it, you're a lot less apt to to maybe, you know, figure, you go if you're invested, you make it happen. Even if there's a hurricane coming, some of you went to Florida this week, all right? You were extremely invested in something because it was you. It's kind of like if you have an old car, you know, if you have an old car that, that is just not, you know, you don't wash it all the time anymore. You don't really care if your kids eat in it anymore because it's just an old car, no big deal. But if you get a new car, or in my case, like a, a new to you car. I, I, the only new car smell I ever got was in an air freshener. But if you get like a, a, a new car or a new to you car, like you're out there hand washing the car. You're like, no, don't bring that in here, right? You know, you, you don't even want your kids to get in the car, right? You, you have made this investment into something. So the idea is this. We're all investing in different things in our lives. We're, we're passionate about things. We are putting our time, our effort, our thought. And those things that we invest in, our heart continues to go in that direction. So we're all investing in something, but often the things that we are investing in don't last. Often the things that we're so passionate about are things that don't matter all that much. We should be investing in things that will last instead of things that will quickly fade away. In Matthew, it talks about this in in a story you've probably heard, Matthew chapter 6. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be. He says right there in the scripture, what you begin to store, what you begin to put effort into, that is what is is guiding your heart. That is what becomes your motivation. In essence, this whole message today is this idea that God gave to us so long ago. We have been created to pour out and not to store up. We have been created to pour out what God is is doing and giving and blessing us with, not to store up things for ourselves. Jesus himself said it in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's how God created us to be. He created us as beings that desire to pour out. And I think that we really do want to pour out more than we do. I think we enjoy it when we pour out. We enjoy it when we bless others. We enjoy that feeling. We find joy when we help somebody out, don't we? We find joy when we we meet the needs. Like if you buy a meal for someone, there's a sense of joy in being able to do that. If you buy groceries for someone, we've been a part of things through the Dollar Club that we enjoy to support together as a church because it allows us to do great things, pay off rent and, and, and to help people buy a car. We've done incredible things because it brings us joy to see the way that God can use us to bless other people. We find satisfaction in often knowing that we have enough to be able to help somebody else out in need. And the reason we have joy in all of those things is because that's the way we've been created. We've been created to pour, not store. So then it begs this question. If we've been created to pour and not store, why is it such a struggle for so many to be generous? Why do the statistics tell us that on average only 5% of believers tithe or give their entire 10% that God has asked us to give? Why is that so, such a struggle? Of those that do give, we've mentioned this before, those that do uh, give something but don't give the whole tithe, the average gift is $17 a week. That's less than you will spend on lunch today. So why is it such a a difficult way for us to, to experience this pour out instead of store up for us? What is the problem? I think it all comes down to one word, and that word is enough. 
We want to be generous. We want to be givers. We want to invest. We really want to do these things. And we would like to give more, but often we feel like in order to give more, we need more. And so if we live this this life of needing more all the time, in essence, what we're doing is living a life of fear. We're living scared. We've got to protect what we have because if we give more, then there's not going to be enough left for us. And that fear dictates whether or not we pour or we store. We live something that I like to call the win-then mentality. When I get more, then I'll give more. But it comes back to enough. We never have enough. We never get to the point where we feel comfortable enough to pour out because we're, we're living when, then. When I get it, then I'll give it. So we continue to store instead of pour. Luke chapter 12 tells us a story about a man that did just that. It says, he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store up my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you got plenty of grain laid up for many years. Life is easy. So eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get everything that you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. It's not a suggestion. It's not a like, you should do this, you could do this. It is a command from God, the Father himself, that says, I command you to pour and not store because that's the way you've been created. You don't get a lot of amens when you talk about investing or giving on a generous Sunday. But it's the truth. And I, I, I love this part. I always imagine this part, and maybe this is just me, right, kind of growing up in the 80s. When he says, you fool, all I can think of is the Mr. T voice. And Jesus is saying, I pity the fool that stores instead of pours. That's how I read it. A life that stores instead of pours is a life that is filled with fear, plain and simple. If you live a life where you are constantly storing up instead of pouring out, you in essence are living in fear. And that's not the God that we serve. We serve a God that is opposite of fear. We serve a God of peace. We serve a God that provides. We serve a God of abundance, a God that pours into his creation. We serve a God that provides for the needs of his people. And most often he even continues to pour beyond our needs. I mean, some of us know that. We've lived that. That is our story. God pours into these overflowing blessings because the God we serve is not a God of scarcity. The God that I serve and the God that you serve is a God of abundance. Remember back in week one, we talked about the story of the woman that marched into the house of the Pharisees. We, we talked about the way that uh, the Pharisees used to throw these extravagant parties where they would uh, eat together and they would swap stories. And it was like an invite only kind of a party. And, and then this woman who was broken, had a very broken past, heard this message of hope from Jesus. And when she heard that message of hope from Jesus, she immediately goes and she doesn't care that she's not been invited. She doesn't care that she's not welcome. She walks past all of the snickers. She walks past all of the, the whispers of the people in the town that have said, stay away from her. She, she does things that are immoral. She does things that are wrong. She is not one of us. She doesn't belong here. She walks past all of those things and she walks straight into the party and she walks right to Jesus. And what does she do? Pours out the perfume all over his feet. She pours everything that she had. We talked about the fact that the, the perfume that she pours out on the father's feet was like her whole year's salary. She basically said, I am all in. Here is everything that I have. And you know what I think she was saying in that moment? The teachable moment that I believe that this woman was teaching that is so vital for us today is this. If he is good enough to forgive me, then he is powerful enough to provide for me. 
that will change the way you live everyday life. You come in this place and you worship God and you throw your hands up and you desire to be forgiven by God. You will give anything, you have given anything to believe in the forgiveness of the Father and the way that he has changed your life. But if he is good enough to forgive you, you also have to believe that he is powerful enough to provide for you. It's faith. It's faith. If we really believe God is good enough to forgive, we have to believe in his power to provide. That's what faith is. It doesn't stop at forgiveness. It begins with this life of trust. That's why we intentionally receive tithes and offerings at the beginning of the service. Man, I told you this a thousand times. It makes no sense. Other pastors are like, why do you do that? People aren't even in the room yet. You're not going to get everything you need to get in the offering because you're doing it at the beginning. It's not about what we get. I could care less. I just want us to be obedient followers of Christ. That's on you, not on me. And so if God asks for our faith to begin with giving back to him, then why shouldn't we start every time that we worship together at the very beginning saying, here's what I have for you. Here's my tithe. Here's what you have provided for me. Now I can begin to worship you. Now I'm ready to worship you because my first act of faith is giving back and acknowledging the way that you have provided for me. In Luke chapter 9, which is a little bit earlier, he tells another story about the feeding of the 5,000 plus, right? He tells this story and it's one of the largest crowds that Jesus ever spoke to in anything that he ever spoke. And it's also one of the longest messages that Jesus ever spoke. You ever been in a message that just went on a little bit too long? Don't answer that. Y'all are like, no, I'm busy. oh, it is after 11. Sorry. Disciples are starting to fee- feel that rumble in their belly because Jesus is going on and on and on. And they come to Jesus in Luke 9 and they say this. They say, late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place out here. He replied to them, you go give them something to eat. The disciples display this scarcity mindset, right? They're they're talking to all these people about uh, faith and what it looks like to come into the kingdom of God. but, But when it comes time to feed themselves and to feed these other people, what they display is this. But we'd love to, but there's not enough. We, we only have this. We can only do so much. We, we can only do what, what we have. This isn't going to work. This is impossible. And it sounds so similar to how many conversations I have with church people all the time. Well, you know, we can only reach so many people. In the community that we're in, we can only do so much. We can only meet so many needs. I can only do so so much because I I don't have enough. And we begin to to spout off all of these excuses to the one that is generous and can provide more than we can ever dream or imagine. We're telling him, I would do more, but I just don't have it. It sounded ridiculous when the disciples said it, and it sounds ridiculous when we say it to the Father. Watch Jesus. Taking five loaves and two fish, he looks up to heaven He gives thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them, gave it to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. I always wonder when the disciples, when he, when, he, when he breaks it and he gives it to the disciples. I was a youth pastor for a really long time. You know how you order pizza ahead of time and then everybody shows up and you're like, this ain't going to work. I did not order enough. So you go to all the students and you go, start with two pieces. Then you can come back if there's any left over. I imagine that the disciples went to those first couple people and they were like, we have no idea if this is going to work. If you just take a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread, we'll see what happens, right? But they didn't just eat a little It says they ate until they were satisfied. That feeling when you sat down for your birthday meal and you ate way too much, that's what I imagine the people did that day. They ate until they were satisfied completely and then there were 12 baskets to be picked up afterwards because God is a God of abundance. This is what happened. Notice this pattern. Look at this pattern that happens here. Jesus blessed the food. That's what he does. That's where he begins with. He blessed. The disciples then give what has been blessed. 
And as they give what has been blessed, God multiplies what has been given. You see that? What if we did this? See, we often ask God, you know, we, we, we bless what we give to him. God, thank you. Or, or, will you bless it? Will you use it? If we give it, then it can be multiplied. But somewhere in here, we stop with the blessing and we don't do the giving. And this is the truth of what happens in this moment. What you keep is all that you have. What you keep, it, 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 that's the extent. That's where it's going to end. If you hold on to it and you, you grip it tightly, that's all you have. But if you pour it out, God can multiply it and do more than you could ever dream or imagine with what you give to God. If you desire for it to be multiplied, if you desire to see things happen, if you really desire, if you really mean that prayer of God, your kingdom come, your will be done, then don't stop with storing it up, but pour it out so that he can multiply and do far more than you could dream or imagine. Being generous is what it means to be invested. And it's more than just an action step. Being invested is a condition of your heart. It's a mindset. It's a lifestyle. It's who we become. Being invested happens when we allow God to truly transform our heart. In the Old Testament, we're taught about the tithe. It's 10%. That's what he asks us to give. In the New Testament, it confirms the tithe, commanding followers, be obedient even in the tithe. In Malachi, it says this. In the beginning, it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. It's a direct response to people that have been withholding from God. They're holding back for themselves. They're storing it up. Many of us look at this scripture and we go, "Woo." 10%, there's just no way. I've done the math. 10% is not going to work. How could I do that? I would have to change things. I would have to rearrange things. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. It, it, the 10% is not just going to work out. It's going to take faith, real faith, in order for it to happen. That takes this crazy kind of faith. You're right. It does. It takes a crazy faith to pour out and to do what you don't think is possible. But I would say this morning, give it a shot. This is the only place in scripture where Jesus says, test me in this. The second part of the verse says, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it up. When we decide to stop storing and start pouring, God promises that in turn, he will pour back into you. Not my words, his words. If we desire to be poured into from the almighty God creator of this universe, it begins with a faith that pours. After all, uh, we invest in a lot of things, right? We invest in things. We want to invest and make investments. And every time that we make an investment, we want to make a smart investment. We want to make a, an investment. Can I tell you that there is no better investment that you can make than changing the life of somebody else? No better investment. So this is what happens when you make an investment here at Concord. Some of you know this, but some of you may not know what it looks like when you tithe, when you give to the church. Here's what happens. First of all, you support missionaries all around the world. These are actual missionary families that you are supporting when you tithe, when you give every Sunday morning. When you give, you are allowing missionaries to share in 164 world areas the truth that Jesus loves them, and we're seeing lives changed. That's what you're doing when you tithe. When you tithe, you are supporting Christian education. You're supporting education to students. Many of our students that are here today from our, our colleges and universities, many of us who have been trained through these colleges and universities, you are supporting when you tithe. When you tithe, there are, there are opportunities for us to, to share. We have 51 colleges and universities and seminaries that we support. That happens immediately when you tithe. 
You support retired ministers. Can I tell you? It's not a lot. It really isn't. You want to see the numbers? Ask Brother Dan. He will show you what it looks like, right? Retired ministers don't get much, but, but can you imagine a, a better thing to give to than somebody that gave their entire life to serve the kingdom of God than to share back with them at a time that, that has passed? There's no better thing to share and to give. You support these ministries that are at our church. You support our children's ministry. Our children's ministry right now is continuing to grow and to change. On, on a Wednesday night, it is loud in here. It's crazy. Footsteps and screaming and hollering. And you know what they're screaming and hollering about? Jesus. Kids, many of you are in here with us today. We desire that you would never know a day that you don't know Jesus. And tithing meets that goal. It meets that opportunity. You support our students. You just heard from these voices this morning. How can you deny that the Holy Spirit of God is at work in our youth group? We, listen, many of the students that were on the platform today, I guarantee most of you don't know half of them. We're not just trying to reach people that have grown up in the church, we are trying to share the message of hope for anybody that desires to come and define what looks different than the world that is fighting against them every day. And the schools that they find themselves in and the relationships that they find themselves in, do you know why this place is different? It was said today, I feel loved here. I feel heard here. They don't feel that there. And it is in us and it is through us to share that love with what God is doing in our, our youth ministry. But the love that they're feeling is not just our love, it's the love of Jesus Christ. And you support that ministry. You support a college ministry right now. You support a ministry that is sharing with, with college students. Many of our college students are here on Wednesday night. This room is, is packed full of college students. We have taken a step, a leap over the last three years to invest into this particular age group. And God is blessing it. God is changing lives. We have more college students serving you right now than you even know. College students are running our media this morning. College students are leading us in worship. College students are here at recess on a Friday night. It's the college students that are serving us even more than we're able to serve them. And do you know why it's so crucial that we serve this generation? That we share with this generation? Because we know this to be true. 70% of young people between the ages of 18 and 22 who went to church are leaving the church. 70%. Not, not just 70% of that age group, 70% of people that grew up in the church hit 18 to 22 and are done with the kingdom of God. We don't think that's acceptable. We're not going to allow that to happen on our watch. And when you invest, when you give, you're changing the statistics. Your investment goes to all of our ministries. It goes to, to recess. We just talked about last night this, this idea that we are truly changing and shaping and reshaping the way the world sees our families. You support online ministry. I, I know some of you, you know, sometimes you're like, why are you talking to the camera? Who's out there? Number one, I see you out there. Love you. <laughs> On average, every week, we have 100 people that watch this service. 100 people that are not on campus with us. Some of them are a different state. Some of them are different places. Some of them just on vacation. Couldn't make it this week. But your investment allows us to share the message of Jesus Christ beyond just the four walls that we sit in. Your tithe... Your investment is reaching people with the gospel. It's restoring relationships. It's healing hurt. It's saving marriage. You tell me where else you will find a return on your investment that is better than that. You won't. Your investment to the kingdom does far more 
than you can ever dream or imagine. It could do even more if we were all, all in. And that's my dream. My dream is to see what God can do if we continue to all be obedient. Man, I would love to just sit back. I would love to see his Holy Spirit continue to just take over this place. Man, I'm gonna go wherever you go, God. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I'll say yes to whatever you wanna do because if we see altars filled and we see baptisms full because we're seeing life change through people that have, have gone from helplessness to a hope that can't be found anywhere else, there's nothing better than that. That's our mission. That's our goal. We want to see lives changed. So we come to the end of this series talking about making an investment. You can do it a ton. Of, you can write a check. We still do that. Old fashioned. Some of you don't know what a check is. You can write a check. You can give online. You can give in the app. You can do it any way you want to. There is one family in our church that tells a story. And I love this story. They're not satisfied with just investing in the kingdom, but they have set it as a goal in their household to teach their children what it looks like to invest in the kingdom of God. This family in our church will gather the entire family around the kitchen table and together with mom and dad will share with their children with the checkbook open. It's time for us to write our tithe check, family. We're giving this to God. This is our tithe. This is what God has given us. And we're making an investment back into the kingdom. Can you just imagine that powerful image of what it would look like as a family to sit together and say, we invest and we're going to make sure that the next generation also continues to invest in the kingdom of God. Make your investment a family affair. Make your investment in God something that you share with the generation. Hey, and look, college kid, teenager, investing doesn't start when, when you get your first real job. Anything that God blesses us with, we make an investment back into his kingdom. So we close out this series of being all in. We want to be all in. If you want to be all in, first, you need to know you have been invited. You have been invited in the family of God. You have a seat. You belong in this place. You are invaluable. We need you. You belong. You are not just a number, but you matter. Your gifts matter. It's not just that your financial investment matters. Your heartbeat matters. Your service matters. Your gifts matter to the kingdom of God. You're influential. Don't leave it up to somebody else. Who is in your circle? Who is in your circle of influence? Who can you be an influencer to, to allow them to experience a life change that they can't find anywhere else? And finally, if you're all in, then be invested in the kingdom of God. Let it be your, your first act of faith in him and not your last act of faith that you are all in. You are a disciple of Christ. You are a son and a daughter of the king. Will you stand with me and pray this morning? God, this morning, will you help us to be a people that pour out blessings and don't store them up for ourselves? Help us to see your kingdom come and your will be done at this very time, God. We desire to be led and directed by you. And God, we are seeing what it looks like when we allow that to happen. God, we are seeing your spirit move. We are seeing lives change. We are seeing people introduced to the love that you have. And God, I can't wait to see what you do as we as a church continue to be obedient and follow your Holy Spirit. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're going to do. And I pray this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. All my family said, amen. amen.